Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at All Things Relative. Uh, we have Kathy Nielsen here, who will be talking yeah, yeah. about the U.S. Census. Um, one thing that I ask is if everyone can mute themselves uh, during the presentation, just to help limit distractions. And then if any questions do arise during Kathy's presentation, please feel free to put them into the chat. And then I can read them out, out loud at the very end. Um, or at the very end, we'll have some time for some question and answering. And so you, at that time, feel free to unmute yourself. And at this time, I turn it over to you, Kathy. Thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so let's check out the 1950 census and others. I'm, as I was preparing for this um, class, I just went down so many rabbit holes and I'm sure that you will, you have two already or that you will. And I'm gonna give you some tips on, and tricks on how to find um, your family in the 1950 census. But I wanna go back a bit and um, kind of talk about the census and some of the, the past censuses before we get into the 1950 census. Uh, the United States Census is legally mandated by the US Constitution. And it's a population census that takes place every 10 years. The first one was in 1790. And the most recent one that has been released, 1950, is the 17th census. And the one that we just took is the 24th census. So there's quite a bit of history um, with these 24 censuses that have been taken. It's really important um, tool for statistical data for policy making. And uh, the House of Representatives and federal funding are apportioned based on our census populations. So at times it becomes almost a political tool and the kinds of questions that are asked um, may have some bearing on the party that is in office. And if we go back, we can see um, the statistics about slaveholders um, and various things that really are representative of our history. So the census is not just about genealogy, but it really is about the history of our country. The 1950 census is the last census in which an enumerator that is a person who was taking the census, actually came to the door and spoke to the family. In 1960, it was mailed out and has been uh, ever since then. And it's made public every 72 years on August 1st at 1201. <laughs> so that is, uh, our next one will be uh, in 2032 on April 1st at 1201. So why is it such a big deal for those of us that are family historians? Well, it is one of our favorite sources. It is the first place when we're just getting into genealogy to start searching for our family. And the amazing thing about the census, it allows us to follow a family and its descendants through time. So we can check in on our families every 10 years and see where they are, what they're doing, um, what children they have. It provides a snapshot of that time in April of that year. So what do we learn from the census? Well, there's all kinds of things and, and every census has had different questions. It tracks the movement of a family. It identifies the names of, of those family members and, and neighbors too. Um, it can give us insights into birth and marriage years. Doesn't necessarily say the exact birth or marriage year, but we can figure it out. Um, it gives us occupations and sometimes even salaries. So really personal information is on the census. It can tell us about living arrangements, whether our family lives on, in a house or on a farm, the educational level of our family members, whether or not they've been in the military service, and whether they're immigrants and, and naturalization status. And in the case of immigrants, it may even give us uh, the area or the town where our family is from um, back in the old country. So this is the 1790 to 1840 census, and it's a little trickier to use, but once you get the hang of it, it does have a lot of information. 
Um, this is an 1830 census from Augusta, Oneida County in New York. And you can see uh, John Green is up there in blue. That's the relative of mine. And the, the, the sort of markings are children or people in his household. So that first column says that there are two children between the ages of zero and five, but doesn't give the names of those children. So in the case of this census, I've had to go tracking down other sources like baptismal records or uh, wills or whatever to try and figure out who those children were from zero to five in 1830. And I did that for all of the family members. Um, John is uh, there, uh, the third one down, he was between 30 and 39. And Sarah, his wife at the very end is a female, 30 to 39. So you think, well, gee, that's a lot of work. Well, it is, but still we can place him in time. We know that he's in Augusta, Oneida County in 1830. We know that he does have quite a family and we can see his neighbors. Now remember we talked about the fan club, the friends, associates, and neighbors. Just as we have friends, associates, and neighbors, our ancestors did too. And these people are on the census probably right on the same page because they lived uh, the farm down the road. So this is information that can be very interesting. They may have signed deeds or wills. Uh, they may have gone to the same church. So that's, that's very interesting information as we put the story of our families together. So that's a 1790 to 1840 census. In 1850, it got a little easier and they started to identify the actual members of the family. And you can see down at the bottom on the first page is Samuel Monroe. Um, notice that they separate families. So if you find a page, go to the page before and the page after because some members of your family might be on another page. And this is a perfect example of that. But here you see the names and the ages and uh, where, the, where the, this family was born. And those little marks in the column on the right are education. Um, those kids are still in school. That indicates the uh, Monroe family uh, members are still in school. So it gets a little easier in 1850. Okay, so I, I, I put this together because I wanted to show you how you can develop your family tree using the census. And we start with ourselves because we know ourselves and then we can go to our parents because we pretty much know the information about our parents. So this is how you do it. And this is why the census is so important to take us back through time. You don't start in the 1700s and come back to yourself because there's mistakes in there. You really start with yourself. So if you look at the bottom person on my family tree, that's my mom and my dad. And I'm going to look at Sarah Monroe. Um, she was born in May of 1920. Because she was born in May, she is not in the 1920 census. Only people born up to April 1st would be in the 1920 census. So she's in the 1930 census. So I've summarized the information I've gotten from each of these censuses. You can see that she was nine in 1930. And if you go up to the top here, you can see her mom and dad. John R. Monroe and Catherine Monroe. Okay, I've got a clue for the next generation. And now I can go hunting for John R. Monroe. Here we are, John R. Monroe and Catherine. These are my grandparents. I can look for John R. Monroe. Here he is. He's age five, he's single, he's born in California. And his parents are Dee Monroe and Emma Sarah Monroe. Aha, I can go to the next generation. Emma Sarah and Daniel Monroe. And now I want to skip to Emma. Emma was born in 1848. Her father was out of the state. He was in the California gold rush. So he's not in the 1950 census. So I've skipped to 1960 when he's back home. He did very well, by the way. Look at this value of real estate. $12,000 value of personal estate. $5,000. He did really well in the gold rush. I wish I knew more of that story. Comes back to Michigan, buys all kinds of property, and um, comes back to his family. 
1860, Emma is 12. We know her father is John Green, John Willis Green, and her mother is Harriet. We can go looking for John Willis Green. Here he is. 1824, he wouldn't be in the 1820 census. He's going to be in the 1830 census. And here he is, born 1824. He also had a father, John Green, and a wife, Sarah. So you see how the census builds on each other. And this is how you can actually put together your family tree by going from one generation to the next. So that's why the census is a really basic tool as we develop our family history. I want to look a little bit more at this Daniel Monroe and Emma Sarah. I've summarized Daniel Monroe's information from the censuses that I was able to find. And you can see where immediately I can track him in terms of where he's moved. He was in Michigan. He moved to San Francisco. Uh, 1860, I don't have the census because he was in college and I've lost him in 1860, but I know he was at the University of Michigan uh, through other sources. But in 1870, he shows up in San Francisco. He's 30, he's married. He has a personal estate of $500, not bad. And he's a lawyer in San Francisco. 1880, he's moved down to Monterey. He's 40, he's married. He's now got quite a few children. He had two children, he had a child in San Francisco. He's now got quite a few kids. And now in 1900, he's moved to um, Hollister. Still a lot of kids living at home. And then in 1910, he's moved to San Francisco and he dies in 1914. I can follow his life and his children through the census. And here he is with his wife when they moved to San Francisco in 1868. So you can see why the census is such a valuable um, source for, for family historians. I took those places that he's lived and charted it where he, he was born in, in, Tor in uh, Toronto, York at that time it was called. He moved to Michigan, he moved to San Francisco, he moved to Monterey, San Lucas is by King City, he moved to Hollister, he moved to San Francisco. These are all things that um, the census showed me and I could follow his, his migration. So the census is a really important um, source for family historians. Now you ask, okay, so you find him in one census, how do you find him in the others? Well, that's where our big four come in ancestry, my heritage, family search, find my past. So we simply put in his name. Uh, you may remember those of you that were with me a couple of months ago, we talked about Heritage Quest. I love Heritage Quest. It is a free database and I love databases. At the Monterey Public Library, um, simply go to um, see if that's gonna come up. I'll come back to that. You go to simply go to the Monterey Public Library, put in your library card, and it's free. And as you can see, the census is uh, on Heritage Quest. In any case, I put in Daniel Monroe, and other censuses come up. So here I am. I've got already, I can start to build uh, this pattern of his life. Notice over here, though, that information differs on each census. On one census, he's born in Michigan, another he's born in Canada, another Michigan, another Canada. I tend to go with the one that's closest to his birth, Canada. Um, and I, I've made the assumption he was born in Canada, and there's actually a kind of an interesting backstory. And, you know, bear with me, but you know, I'm, st I'm the storyteller. Um, Daniel's father, Samuel, and his uncle, Peter, were involved in a rebellion that took place in York, in current day Toronto, um, to try and overthrow the British government in, that, in Ontario, in Upper Canada. And it was not successful. Um, ironically, his grandfather, his family were loyalists, but in any case, he was involved in this rebellion. He was jailed for two weeks over Christmas, and he was not convicted and he was released in January. Daniel was to be born in January. And so the question is, was he born in Canada or in Michigan where the family decided to get out of Dodge and leave Canada and come to America? Where was he born? Well, 
I think it's hard to believe Samuel, Samuel could sell his land and move to Michigan in the winter just before Daniel was born. And records indicate that Samuel didn't sell his land until February, 1838. So the question is, where was Daniel born? I, we don't know. Marriage license says Michigan. Death certificate says Mich Michigan. Census says Canada. But it makes sense that he probably still was in Canada. Uh, the family does not show up again until the 1850 census. So in 1840, they're traveling somewhere. So um, that's kind of the backstory on why this is all different. And you're going to find some backstories as you do your research as well. And I think that's what makes it interesting. So here we are. Um, he is in the 1850 census and he's in Canada. Okay, so sometimes the person interviewed, because the enumerator, census taker, comes to the door and someone answers the door and you don't know who it's going to be. They're not supposed to interview a child. Uh, they have to get an adult, but they may have interviewed the spouse who really doesn't know all the details about their husband or wife. So sometimes information can is maybe not quite correct. Um, sometimes the enumerator may have jotted down the wrong information, may have misspelled a name, spelled it phonetically. Um, and that, you know, 100, 200 years ago, name spelling wasn't as important as it is now. And that's why we have all these name variations. And sometimes your ancestor may have just given the wrong information. And Daniel was giving Canada at one census and Michigan at another. Maybe he doesn't even know where he was born. So we have to sort of take these, um, some of these errors or this information, um, we have to sort of think about it. It's not always absolutely correct. Now, you may have noticed that I didn't even talk about the 1890 census. And sadly, um, that was destroyed in a fire um, and the damage was done largely by water. Fortunately, other um, censuses were further upstairs and not damaged, but the 1890 was definitely damaged and there wasn't at that time techniques to try or they did not make any uh, effort to try and preserve that that could have been preserved. So we've totally lost the 1890 census, but not to despair, um, there are substitutes, city directories, states have taken censuses and there's tax assessments. There's other ways we can find that information, but that is definitely a loss. We have, we're, we have a 20 year period there where we don't have a census. Okay, so the census is released every 72 years. And from 1790 to 1870, anybody could go to uh, the Census Bureau or where the documents were, it wasn't sealed. There was a copy in Washington and there was a copy in the local courthouse. So anybody had access to the census. Um, but from seven, 1870 to 1972, it was moved to the Census Bureau. And in 1942, it was transferred to NARA, which is the National Archives and Records Administration. It was transferred 72 years after the 1870 census. So Many people think it's just arbitrary that we have the 72 year, that is 1950, is released in 2022. Some people say, well, it's an expected lifespan and it's for privacy issues. Um, but in any case, it's now a law and the census will not be released until every 72 years. If you are looking for information about yourself, you, there is a form you can fill out and you can uh, send that to NARA and um, you are able to find information, but it has to be about yourself. So other than that, it's sealed until it comes out. And that's why it's such a big deal on April 1st um, for family historians. So let's move ahead to the 1940 census and then we'll get into the 1950 census. The 1940 census was so exciting. That was in 2012. That was when I was just getting into to family history. And it was a chance to see my grandparents and my parents and aunts and uncles. And um, I, it was really very exciting. And I helped index, so I was involved in that. And I, I just, it was um, almost like Christmas. Um, the interesting thing about the 1940 census, census is it reflected the lives of ancestors during the Depression and exactly what kinds of things they were going through. 
So the questions in the 1940 census were the number of household in order of visitation, and then things about your house, whether you owned it or rented it, the value of your home, um, and if you lived on a farm or not, the members of your family and the relationship, so that was helpful, a personal description, that is uh, your race, your gender, um, whether you had, whatever your education was, your, where you were born, your citizenship, employment status, income, all kinds of things. So let's look at those of you that were with me when I talked about uh, Every Home Has a Story and the Prunedale Ranch in my family. Let's look at the 1940 census for my great grandmother. This is in Prunedale. She's living on her family ranch. She's 89 years old. Um, and if we go down here, we can see the census and numerator. She's the 61st um, home or, or household that the numerator has um, canvassed. She owns her home, the O. This is the value. It must be like about $1,500. I don't know why that would be 15, but it is the value of the ranch. She says it's not a ranch, probably because it's not a working ranch now. She's 89 years old and she's lost her husband. And here she is. This little X up here shows that she's the person that was at the door when the enumerator came. She's the one who's answered these questions. She's white, she's 89, she's a widow. Um, she's not been in school. She's from Canada. She lived in the same place in 1935. That's one great thing about the 1940 census is it takes you back to 1935. So she's been on this ranch, she's still there. Uh, she had no, no other income coming in. Now, people, this is very interesting. This is her, her grandson-in-law married to my aunt and they're living with her. He is a male, he's white, he's 50. Um, he's from North Carolina. He has uh, a sixth grade education. And he's been living there for five years. He and my aunt have been taking care of her because uh, she's getting older. And in fact, she does die within the year. Um, but he has not been employed. And this question here is, yes, I'm looking for a job. He's probably helping with, the, with their, this ranch, but he's not been employed. He has been re-employed the beginning of this year. He's had a job for 16 weeks now in 1940. He's a laborer, farm laborer. But last year, he only worked 20 weeks and he made $360. So this is sort of an example of, of what's been happening in the 40s and the depression and the rural economy. My aunt, and then my grandmother and grandfather who happened to be visiting from Washington and they're in the census for California. So that's kind of interesting. So in the decorate day that's happened, all kinds of things have happened before the 1950s. For my family, my great grandmother has passed on. My grandfather who was, not, who was in, at Prunedale in 1940 has also died. My parents have gone off to college. They've graduated from college and they've gotten married. My dad has been in World War II. He's been in Europe. I was born and my aunt has remarried. She has another husband now. So that's my family. That decade, a lot has happened. And you can see the difference. A rural community, 1940s, many people on the farm. And all of a sudden we move into the 1950s and we've got the television set and we've got homemakers and we've got people buying houses and new cars and fashion and the soda, the soda fountain. All the brightness after World War II of the 1950s. And definitely a time of transition. We can see our parents and our grandparents, in some place, cases, even ourselves. The economy's booming, babies are being born. People are moving to the cities and the suburbs from the farms. We've got cars and TVs. And the GI Bill is giving veterans a chance to go back to school and buy houses. So the 1950 census is gonna to start to reflect some of this. And again, an enumerator is gonna to come to the door and speak to 
um, family members. This is the last time that a person actually will come to the door. 1950 is the last one. So what's the difference between these two censuses? Okay, the population in 1940 was 132 million and the census cost $67.5 million. Well, in 1950, the population has increased by 14%. We now have 151 million people and we've just had 330 million babies born in the decade from 1940 to 1950, the famous baby boomers. So maintaining the numerators and clerks is gonna cost double the cost. So the government comes up with a solution. Okay, well, we'll offset the cost by not ask all the same questions. Well, we'll ask 15, 14 fewer questions. That'll make it a little bit cheaper. But every fifth person on that census, we're gonna ask some additional questions. So we'll still get some questions in there. We just won't ask everybody all those questions. So there's already a cost saving um, aspect here because it was gonna be in a very expensive proposition. And again, more information that we're gonna find about um, our families. Um, we're gonna find out about occupation, veteran status, neighbors, um, grades, how much they earned even, even personal information like that. But now we got to find the enumerators. The first enumerators back in the 1800s were US Marshals. They were not trained. They didn't even have forms. They were, in some cases, they were writing them on pieces of paper. So again, you know, we have to look at those censuses with that in mind. But by 1879, Congress said, okay, we're gonna hire enumerators, they're gonna be people trained, let's make this really professional. In 1950, a decision was made to go out and recruit teachers. The census people figured that teachers were literate, that they were, had some expertise with math, and they were hopefully pretty good at, in terms of relationships, in terms of communicating with people. So there was a big movement to get teachers. Each enumerator was responsible for an enumeration district, and that's the ED. And that person canvas his or her district for two to four weeks. That would be in the month of April. In 1950, 26 chief instructors would teach 100 instructors to train 8,300 crew leaders who would train over 140,000 women. So this was an amazing, amazing job. A reference manual was um, created and uh, that's online. If you have questions about um, some of the notations on the census, you can look at that. And it's very interesting actually, it's 24 pages all the things that enumerators needed to know how to do and how to fill out the forms. So we've got our, our, our numerators all set up and they're all ready to go out and um, canvas their district. When this information comes back, it goes into the first computer. It's the first computer used in processing the census and it was UNIVAC. And the UNIVAC, um, computer weighed 16,000 pounds and it had something like 5,000 vacuum tubes. Remember the vacuum tube, those of you that are uh, older, the vacuum tubes were, were in our TV sets and when a vacuum tube would, would blow out, we had to get a TV repairman to replace it. Well, these computers had 14,000 or 16,000 vacuum uh, tubes. So this was really a new thing using the computers. First time it was used in public use, uh, computers have been used in the military up until that point. So as different today, different organizations, Ancestry, Family Search, My Heritage, have all been getting ready for the census and preparing for it. They've been preparing for it for a years for it to come out. And these are some of the things that have been happening behind the scenes before April 1st. NARA, National Archives, and Ancestry have been working together on optical character recognition. They've created a program that will read the handwriting of on the census and then index it. So they're using, been using artificial intelligence to convert that handwritten record 
to a digital tech. So that's been going on. And Nara has been, Ancestry has been helping Nara with that. And Nara was all, has been working on that actually as it get, got ready to release um, the data. Steve Morse, which is another, we'll talk a little bit about more him. He's a computer engineer, a retired computer engineer who set up this amazing web page to help you figure out who your enumeration district is for members of your family. We'll talk about him. He's at stevemorris.org. He's been working. So on April 1st at 12.01 a.m., NARA released the digital images of the 1950 census in the cloud. Now in 1940, we didn't, when that was released 10 years ago, we didn't have the same opportunities for the cloud. And Ancestry and Family Search were at NARA with their vans, with their hard drives, picking up uh, the census um, uh, report on their hard drives to take them back to their offices, to download them to their servers. But this year, uh, it was put up in the cloud. And the minute it was put up at 12.01, and NARA released its preliminary indexing based on this artificial intelligence, Ancestry, Family Search, and MyHeritage started downloading um, 6.9 million images from NARA and uploaded them to their own websites. But they weren't indexed. They're available to browse, but they weren't indexed. The only indexing that we have is that is what NARA has done of the head of the household, only the head of the household, um, based on uh, character recognition, handwriting character recognition. So Ancestry is currently using OCR now to further read the handwriting and index the images that it's uploaded. Family Search is using volunteers to double check the records and make corrections to the names that have been identified. So Ancestry and Family Search have been really busy and MyHeritage is doing its own form of, of um, indexing. Ancestry is releasing their indexing straight state by state. And already, if you have people in Delaware, Wyoming, Vermont, or American Samoa, you can actually go in and use the Ancestry index. As we speak, they're working on Alaska, New Hampshire, the US Virgin Islands. Those should be up by the end of the week. They hope to complete Family Search and Ancestry. And, and it has been working together. These groups have really, really come together. Hope to complete all indexing by June 4th on Flag Day. Now, 10 years ago, it took six months for the indexing. This is actually just two months. This is amazing using this artificial intelligence. So what do we do between now and June 14th? Well, there's some tricks that we can find ourselves. And I'm going to share that with you. But I think that it's just amazing that this is going to happen by June 4th. And not only is it just going to be head of household, it's going to be everybody in the household and different items in the census. For example, if you want to see who worked for the railroad in 1950, it's going to be indexed that way. You're going to be able to pull up all the names of people who worked for the railroad. Um, each of those categories is going to be indexed. So it's just going to be a wealth of information. Okay, so there we are. Um, my Heritage has a little tool, if any of you, and a lot of the index is free on all of these um, paid sites right now because they want you to play around with it. So uh, you may need to sign in as a guest pass, but you can use it. And of course, remember, there's Heritage Quest at the library to play around with the index, with the uh, census. But My Heritage has a very clever thing that, that, that I found interesting. They have a census helper. And what they've done is they've taken your family tree, if you've posted the family tree, they've taken it and they tell you all the people that might be in the 1950 census. So you can see at the top there, or right up here, 275 people uh, in my family tree, in my Monroe family tree, are likely to be found in the census. And I, they started, of course, with my mom and dad, and then it went down 200 more people. So I could get ideas of people that I might want to look for. So that's kind of helpful and, and fun to see who are possibilities that might be in the census. This is the way the form looked. It's called a P1, and the um, enumerator would um, write this out uh, as, as clear as they could. This is what the uh, OCR, the optical character recognition software, is picking up. Picking up these names, isn't this amazing? And indexing them for us. 
I wanted to just say that this is the main part. These are the supplemental questions. On the back of the P1 is this amazing form that was asked of everybody about their, where they lived. Uh, unfortunately, Nara never, never, never microfilmed filmed this. And they use this for statistical data about the dwelling. This would have been amazing information about our ancestors, but these punch cards and schedules were um, destroyed. And that's sad because um, the numerators asked about building materials, age of structure, number of rooms in a house, running cold or hot water, indoor toilet or an outdoor privy, a washing machine, all kinds of questions for, two point, uh, for 46 million dwellings. 2.25 millions were visited each day. That would have been amazing information to see that about where our ancestors were living. Um, they took two months to complete that. They didn't weren't able to do it just in April. But that is, um, they, they pulled the statistics together and that is in, uh, in NARA, but it isn't for each person, unfortunately. Okay, the best place to go, the best first place to go is the NARA, um, the National Census website. And this is what it looks like, National Archives. Welcome to the official 1950 census website. Here's the resources and here's, here's your begin your search and it's free, anybody can get on it. So you can start here. And I started here because I wanted to pick a name of, of, of an uncle who was kind of an unusual name. His name is Brooks Lemons. And he lived in Oakland with my aunt, my aunt May. And I thought, well, that's an unusual name. I hope that the OCR has picked it up. So, cause I didn't know his, the enumeration and I didn't know his address. So I put it in and sure enough, he came right up. And this was a bonanza because did I not only get Brooks Lemons, which is right here, I also got three ants because in 1950, and I'd forgotten this, um, my four, actually there are four ants in this, on this, um, they lived in an apartment complex owned by another cousin. And here's Brooks Lemons and my Aunt May and my first cousin, Rollin, who was born in February, so he is in the census. My brother was born in July. He's not in the census, but this first cousin is. And then unbeknownst to me, they lived next door to my Aunt Arlene and my Aunt Adeline and my Aunt Helen. So I got uh, a five for one on this one. I'll see two, actually six for one. But the interesting thing about this is age and, and name and, and head of the family and relationship. But I found this very interesting about where they worked. My uncle was a paint controller. He was um, uh, with an automobile manufacturer. I think he was out in Fremont. Um, my aunts, my aunt Arlene was, um, worked as a general office worker for a furnace manufacturer. And she must have gotten, she was 33. My other aunt was 20. She must have gotten her job for Aunt Adeline as a PBX operator at that furniture um, manufacturing company. And the oldest aunt, Helen, oh, you may remember I told you my dad had seven sisters. My dad was the only boy. These are four of them. She was 38 and she worked um, as a journal, a bookkeeper and a, a, for a department store. And I believe it was uh, Montgomery Ward. So they all lived together on the same street. And this says they were from a very small farming town in San Joaquin Valley near Modesto. And it would only make sense is if they came to the big city in Oakland, they would want to be not be too far from each other. We find that with our families, that as they move, they travel and they try to stay together. So here they were in 1950, right next door to each other. I love finding that out. Okay, now I wanna look for my dad, for my family, but I couldn't find my dad. I put him into the 1950 census. I knew we lived in Oakland, uh, but Anderson is a common name and I just, he didn't come up. So I thought I'm not gonna find him through NARA. So I've got to try some other things. I know that I have to find the address where we lived in order to find my family. So I went back to the 1940 census, but my family wasn't, you know, they were still in college. That wasn't gonna help me. I could check with my cousins, um, but the main thing was a city directory and the telephone books. And I could go to letters and scrapbooks and diaries, but city directory, I zeroed in on. 
I could not find my father, but I knew I must be living in one of two places, 54th Street or Terra Street, because the 1949 telephone directory said 54th, the 1951 said Terrace. So I located the enumeration district of those two addresses and I browsed the census pages. But I was so disappointed to find first at um, 631 54th Street, and by the way, here's the street name right here. And here's the address, 631 54th Street, uh, five, the third hunt, the third, the 300th person canvassed. Um, but this, these was not my family. So we weren't living there. Somebody else was living there in 1950. Okay, so we'd left, we'd left the street. I then went to the second one, Terra Street. Again, we're not there, it's somebody else. So we're not there yet. This was not until 1950, later in 1950 that we got to Terra Street. So where are we? I, I, I am going where, those are the two streets I know. But I did have some fun when I looked at this. I, this is about neighbors um, because we did move to Terra Street shortly after the census was taken. Mrs. Labity, and that brought back, I went down a rabbit hole with that. Mrs. Labity lived in this little house. This is today, Google, it was in lovely condition when she was there. She was, uh, seemed like so old. She must've been in her nineties, I thought. But I was this little five-year-old that was probably roller skating and riding my bike up and down the street. And I would chat with her. She'd be out in her garden and I'd chat with her and we developed a friendship, this five-year-old, and I found through the census, she was 72. She was really a youngster. I thought she was ancient. Um, I'd chat with her and she'd invite me in for cookies. And um, she gave me a book. She, I told her I was reading, you know, Dick and, Dick and Jane and Spot. Uh, I was learning to read and she gave me a primer, 1898, Hawaii. She said, oh, she says, maybe you would like this because now that you're starting to read and I still have this. So Mrs. Labadee became my friend. Um, Mrs. Labadee, uh, I of course I had to find more. I, I, I did, as a five-year-old, I didn't know who Mrs. Labadee was. Mrs. Labadee was elected to the national delegation, a democratic de delegation, uh, in 1946 and 1950. She was really active in the Democratic um, Club in Oakland. She was active in her um, uh, active in her neighborhood improvement. She was quite a lady. And as a little, and this is just, I just discovered this yesterday. I only knew her as a nice lady who invited me in for cookies and who was my friend. But to see that on the uh, census brought back all kinds of memories. Okay, meanwhile, back to my family. I've got the 1949 telephone direct directory. I've got the 1951. Where are we in 1950? Like a good librarian, I've got to find the 1950 telephone directory. So I call the Oakland Public Library and they've got it. They have, because the Heritage Quest did not have that indexed, did not have that digitized. And they said my father was listed at 5989 Seminary Avenue in Oakland. Voila, I now can get the ED number for Seminary Avenue. And because I've been organizing my pictures during COVID, I had a picture of Seminary and there I am, check out the Band-Aid on the knee uh, with my dad at uh, the apartment building where, where we lived in Seminary Avenue. So I now know my address. Ancestry has a place where you can put in, go to this page, click on explore now. Um, you can actually get a free account just to do the censuses. So you can register if you don't have an ancestor or you can go to the library. The library has ancestry, but you have to use it at the library. You put in the address and it will tell you what your enumeration district is. And here it is. Here's where I was living, right by Mills College in Oakland. Ancestry has an amazing enumeration maps, the old maps. Um, the Census Bureau would get the maps from the city or the county, and then it would overlay that with the enumeration districts. And so if you're interested in maps, um, Ancestry has these. Also, NARA does too. Okay, um, that the first time I did this, uh, Ancestry wasn't, I couldn't find it. So I thought, okay, I've got to go to Steve Morse. 
This is the man who is the, um, remember I told you the um, internet, the engineer, uh, computer engineer. He has up here, US Census, you can go to the 1950 census. By the way, this is all uh, naturalization and immigration. If you're having trouble finding people, go to his one-step web pages, stevemorse.org, and try these out. It, 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 they're really great. You really can find those immigrants that you have in your family. Any case, further down, he's got the 1950 census. You put in your state, your county, your city, and lo and behold, they give you hundreds of enumeration districts. 67 is Oakland. That's not gonna help me, but I now have the street number. 5989 Seminary Avenue. I put that in and now I've got it down to these enumeration districts. Still doesn't do it for me. If I go to Google, I can put on the city block. I'll show you how I did this. Went to Google. This is what it looks like now. The department house is gone. It's four lane road, but in any case, um, some of these streets are Lindholm and Hillmont. I can now put those in, and now I know what the ED number is, 67-45. I can click on that and go right to uh, it. Sure enough, California, Oakland Alameda, Donald Anderson, 67-45 and my family popped up, and there I am, Catherine. And here it is, my dad was happened to be on the supplemental, so there was additional information about him. And if we look at this a little closer, this made me, this was uh, almost brought tears to my eyes because I could see my dad, this column here is how many hours you work a week. And he was working 72 hours a week because he had just opened a drugstore. He had opened his own business and he was working 72 hours. Of course, as a little three-year-old, two-year-old, um, I wasn't aware of how hard he was working. But here he is, here's the address, here's Seminary Avenue, um, how his age, um, his, he was a pharmacist, a retail drugstore. And here's my mom and here's myself. And these are the categories which when you go through, you can look through each category for yourself. Um, but my dad, here's his drugstore. Um, you see drugs, cosmetics, cigarettes. Um, this was in Oakland down near Lake Merritt. And because that was such a part of the family, you can see that I even played store. My mom must have helped me set this up. That was our life, the drugstore and my dad beginning a new business, a Rexall uh, pharmacy. And to see that he worked 72 hours, I just, you know, he was working so hard. So here are the supplementary questions for my dad. U.S., uh, here he's not working on a farm, he's not on a farm. College educated, um, goes on through the salary, $5,000. I mean, that's a lot of money in those days, but that was his last, his salary position before he moved to, to open his store. Um, shows that he has owned his store, owned his own store. And over in here is the fact that he did fight in World War II, World War I and current service, but he's in this column as yes. I know it's a little blurry, but there was a lot of information also in that part. Okay, so here it is again, supplementary questions. And here he is, um, yes, for World War II. During that time, um, of 1940s and, and what the census told me, of course, he and my mom had graduated from college. They had gotten married. My father had served in World War II. He was a pharmacist on a hospital train and he went into Germany to pick up prisoners of war, wounded soldiers and Holocaust survivors. And he was over there two and a half years. And so this, the story of that experience in his life after just gotten married and then going over to Europe is a whole nother story. The census brought all that back to me of what his life was like in, in columns, working hard, going to war, college education, all the things that he did. So my life, my dad began his new life after World War II. 
and the 1950 census reflected that. This is my brother and myself on the steps at Terra Street, because by this time we'd moved to Terra Street in Oakland. My dad had returned home after serving two and one half years in the military service in Europe. That's reflected in the census. He had a daughter, that's reflected. He invested everything he owned in a drugstore and he worked 72 hours a week to make it happen. He was expecting a baby, a son, my brother, who was born in July and not on the census. And he'd moved his family from Seminary Avenue to Terra Street, closer to the drugstore. My Miami family must have been at Seminary address barely a year or not even a year, but that's where we were for the census. And you may find that too, that even that short time, wherever you are in April, that's where you are on the census. Because my brother came home to Terra Street in July. So by July, we had moved from seminary three months after the census. So the census was a really emotional thing for me to, to go back and track my family down, to learn some things that I didn't know. And as a child, of course, things we're not aware of at all. But it is a snapshot in time. It tells us where our family lived. It gives us insights into the children and other members of our family who lived in our household. The ages of our family members, our neighbors, Mrs. Labadee, brought back memories of Mrs. Labadee. Occupations, businesses, where we worked, our education, and if we served in the military. These are all amazing bits of information as we put together our family a family story. Um, and then we can take this information and use other documents to make our story even fuller. The 1950 census is significant because there were so many baby boomers that are included in it. It may not always be accurate um, because, it, 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 because of the enumerators and because of who reported, but it gives us insight into that time and into our family. And I assure you that you too probably will go down some rabbit holes just as I did. Um, but that's the fun part of being in genealogy and being a family historian. Um, this is all going to be available in June, fully indexed. But in the meantime, if you can't wait, try some of these tips and, tips and tricks that I've, I've shared with you. So what's next? Okay. Next month, we're going to talk about hitting the road. It's time to go on a family history road trip. And I'm going to share some ideas and by a road trip, not only maybe a week or two weeks, but a day. Maybe you're just going out for a day on a road trip. I need to get out to Hollister again. I, I've been meaning to get out there. There's so many things that I want to discover more about my Hollister family. So we're going to talk about how we plan the road trip and how we can make it, uh, make it the most fruitful as, as we explore things about our family. That's going to be next month at four o'clock, and I hope to see you then. And in the meantime, Sean is at the library to answer all of your genealogy questions. And I'm also very happy to help as you do your search and very ha happy to help you with the census. Um, keep me posted how you find if you were able to find your family and what you learn about your family. So, Sean, I'm going to um, turn it back to you and see if we have any questions. And uh, also, I'm interested in in hearing whether or not people have found their family um, well, thank uh, you. so far. Thank you very much, Kathy, for a wonderful presentation. Um, very informative as I've played around with the census and got lost quite a bit. Uh, we One question that came up that um, Jennifer did also answer, but I'll just read it out for the rest of the group. Um, are there census documents available for family information from European countries or other countries such as Australia, New Zealand? How can we access those? Uh, Jennifer chimed in and uh, informed us that um, she can answer about Norway. And in 1900, they only did the census three times. And you can contact the Norwegian American Genealogy Center in Madison, Wisconsin if you need help with translation or the Norwegian State Archives website, but they have a privacy law for a hundred years. So doesn't leave too many, too much room for the 20th century. Do you have any other information yes, about European well, countries? Uh, yes, um, 
uh, England just released its 1920, 1921 census that they also have a long period of time, but that's an exciting census to, to look at. Australia and New Zealand do have uh, periodic censuses that are um, released. I'm not sure how, uh, I'm not sure about the dates on, on how more recent that is. Canada has a census. Um, European countries have a census. Uh, many European countries actually have like a household examination books, the Scandinavian countries. And I don't know, Jennifer, of Norway, but Sweden has household examination books. And that's like a census that was taken in conjunction with the church. So all, um, all of these countries do have some form of a census. And uh, what I would recommend is that you go to Family Search and the Wiki, look up the country that you're searching for, and there would be a section on census that would tell you what is available for that country. Thank you. And at this time, if anyone would like to unmute themselves to ask Kathy uh, a question, please feel, feel free to. Um, also, feel free to type them in the chat and I'll be happy to read them out loud. A um, lot of great comments, wonderful presentation. Um, Carolyn wrote, Lund Lundholm Avenue was named after her family. Oh, amazing. Oh, that's great, Carolyn. So you know that area. So I that's had a question. Great. I had a question. Does this 1950 census, if I was looking at my grandfather, if he was in the military, would he still be on the census? Oh, really good point. If if the family, if the, your, your family member was on American military base in the United States or in one of the uh, American Samoa, U US Virgin Islands, um, yes, it would be in the P1 form. If they were on a base, say in Germany, overseas, somewhere else, there was another form um, I'm not sure what that number was, a P something, and they were, um, they were canvassed and put on that form. The sad thing is that form was not kept. Um, it was used for statistical reasons again, but we are, do not have access to those people who are on foreign bases, sadly. Um, there's a couple of other things that have been destroyed. The infant cards, babies born between January and March, uh, 31st. Um, there's, there's some other things that, uh, that have been destroyed. They were used for statistical reasons, but they were not um, microfilmed. At that time, microfilm would have been the way to preserve it, and they were not. So uh, sadly, no, if, if they were on a base in, in, outside the United States, no, we do not have access to that. Okay, thank you. And a follow-up question, if you, um, because so I wasn't sure if he was in a military base or not, but he has a very common name, Carl Carroll. Is there a way to narrow down the search name? When I searched for him, there was lots of Carls and there was lots of Carols. His last name is, what is his last name again? Carol. Carol. Well, what you want to do is actually put where he, if you know his, when he was born, okay. and you know when, where he was born, that would narrow it down. If you know where he uh, lived after he was born, that would narrow it down. If you know a spouse's name, that would narrow it down. And then what would happen is it will pop up and you can say, okay, well, Arkansas, that's not, um, that's not him. Um, but there is one in the city that you do know. You can see what family members are there. And if it's your family, then you, you've, hit, you've got it. So um, just keep it's just using filters and you don't want to use too many filters because then you may not find anything. Just keep adding filters, just like we do with um, databases. It's the same kind of same principle, but good question. If you do have a common name like Smith or Johnson or Anderson, in my case, um, you will want to use some filters to help you with that. Thank you. Has anybody found um, found themselves or found family members in the in the census yet haven't tried it well i hope that you will will give it a try mm -hmm. i think gail has that's right and eleanor has yeah it's fun it's it's like putting pieces together and when i got that address of seminary i felt like oh i've really i've really done it i felt very good mm -hmm. so if you cannot find an address um 
using Heritage Quest in the directories, call the local library where your family lived and see if they have them. Monterey Public Library has telephone directories, uh, current directories going all the way back. So um, if you have Monterey family, give, give Sean a call. Yes, we have directories. Our oldest directory is 1906. So go all the way back. So you can really track through directories. Well, uh, I wish you all the best. I hope that you find your family. For me, it was a really emotional experience. You could probably tell that just from my voice. Um, just finding things that I didn't really know because I was too young to know. And sadly, I, you know, was I'm not able to ask these questions to my parents, questions that I would be very curious about. We have one question that popped up into the chat um, or a comment. You can sign up on in NARA to be a transcriber, which allows you to correct any mistakes in the OCR index. Yes, and there is a, a button there on the upper right that you may, uh, I didn't point out, it does show you can click on that. And if you find um, something that is wrong, uh, in the, the uh, optical character recognition that has been used, the tool that's been used, you can actually change it uh, and correct it. You can also do that with um, Ancestry if you find it on Ancestry or if you find it in Family Search. And Family Search is looking for volunteers to help index. And those volunteers are looking at what the optical character recognition has done and um, checking to see if you read it the same way as the machine did. And if you don't, then you put in what you think it should be. I, I was seeing um, one uh, webinar that I watched. Uh, I think it was Berry Builders was what the machine picked up, but it was Berry Pickers. I don't know how the machine picked that up, but in, never, in any case, um, sometimes we really do need the human touch to correct what a machine can do. Yes, and if you do get a chance, it is pretty fun to just to transcribe some of these documents. I've done some of the other documents and you come across some very neat things. Yes. So wish you all the best. Go looking for your family. I hope you find some fun things and um, add this to the stories that you tell about your family. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, like Kathy mentioned, we'll be back next month with the road trip, family planning a family road trip or genealogy road trip. And next week, we will be having our Monterey's Magical History Tour with Tim Thomas, who will be interviewing uh, Steinbeck scholar Susan Schillinglaw and talking about the relationships of the artists and friends of John Steinbeck. So if you're interested or want to sign up for the next genealogy um, class, then please visit the Monterey Public Library's event page and all the information will be there. Well, thank you all for joining us. Special thank you, Kathy, for all the information you provided and I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you, Sean, and thank you all for coming. I hope to see you next month. <laughs>